Welcome to the Realtor for Hoopers podcast. When I pull up with my dogs, we gonna ball like swish. No, I ball like No, I ball like All right, so today we got episode 19 of the interview series, and the guest today is Andy Ogade, who graduated from Colorado State. Played for the Nigerian national team, yep. and I'll let you kind of tell the rest of the story, but I appreciate you being on. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Oh, yeah. Good. So the first question we always start everybody off with was, tell us your basketball story. Yeah, basketball story. Uh, so I guess we'll start from high school, right? Yeah. Uh, usually where people start. You can right, start, start from, from when you're school. two years old if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't start playing organized ball until seventh grade. Okay. So um, before that, I was just playing in the yard, playing at the park. Okay. Uh, Seventh grade started playing. Um, started to see that you know what it was what I was doing in the park was actually translating to a game. Yep. Started you know to get a little more serious about it. Um, high school went to a high school that didn't win a game. In Where'd you grow up? Georgia. Georgia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So my parents got divorced. He moved from Marietta, which is like basketball. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially yeah. at the time, they had Patrick Ewing, son, nationally ranked, all that. We moved from there to Dallas, Georgia, and. Uh, it was just a completely different experience. Like yeah. basketball is a little far back. They didn't win a game in three years before you went there. Wow. And then uh, my freshman year, I ended up, uh, you know, making varsity. Actually won a few games. Yeah. So being good. And then for long story short, between my freshman to senior year, we kind of turned it around where we were going to playoffs and things like that. And yeah. I was starting to get recruited. Um, I didn't play AAU until my junior year. And was that a family decision or is that you it was, said? It was more, I didn't really even know about it. Okay. You know, um, I didn't really know much about it, but then I started playing like first was YBOA, which okay. is like a youth yeah, basketball yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I did that, I think my sophomore year. And then I just like, just dominated. And then like the, the Atlanta Celtics and Georgia stars started to come. So Georgia stars, uh, picked me up and then I played with them my junior, uh, my, uh, my junior year. I played with the Smyrna stars, which is like an upstart team that we okay. ended up doing really well as okay. well. My, uh, last year. But uh, my recruitment was just crazy, man. Um, I was committed to Virginia after my junior year. Then I decommitted and ended up going to Ole Miss. And that story was uh, – <laughs> Yeah, I was the same. Well, I, mean, I mean, I loved Ole Miss at school. It was just, uh, you know, the coaching staff, we just didn't really, you know – I mean, I don't want to talk you about You love Virginia, I, the school. No, I did love Virginia, but okay. like backtracking there, um, I decommitted. My mom didn't want me to go out that far. She didn't wow. want me to go that far to school. And so – I decommitted. She didn't want to sign up National Letter of 10. It was this whole, it was this whole it. deal. But I, I got out of it and went to Ole Miss. Um, I was kind of deciding between Georgia and Ole Miss. And okay. I wanted to get a little bit away from home. Okay. Um, so I went there. And basketball-wise, as a freshman, probably wasn't the smartest decision because I had, you know, seven forwards and centers that were in front <laughs> yeah. of me, overclassmen. So, um, you know, I still thought, I, you know, I'm competitive. So I was like, no, I'm still going to play what type of thing. And Long story short, ended up not working out and going through a whole crazy recruiting battle. I was just like, I'm going wherever, you know, this guy goes. So my guy went up being Nico Medved. That's the head coach of CSU okay. now. You know, okay. he was really cool with my AAU coach at the time. Got it. And I trusted him. So I was like, wherever he's going, I'm going. Okay. So they ended up being CSU. So, I mean, everything ended up working out. But yeah, long story short, I finished up at CSU. Okay. And then how did you, how did you get from... You know, a post, you know, post CSU, getting to play in overseas, stuff like that. Yeah, that was strange too. So even that was kind of late because I didn't really know anything about overseas until my junior year of college. And I had already graduated. Um, so we had, I had to sit out a year. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, that extra year, I just kind of, you know, did my schoolwork, whatever. And I was able to graduate after my junior year, which would have been my, naturally my senior year. And then, so I just got my master's with the, with the extra year that I had. But before that, um, I ended up playing in this, you know, basketball tournament in Atlanta and there was a boys and girls club director that was there that was actually from my neighborhood. So he ended up getting me, uh, getting me hooked up with this team from Japan. So I had an offer to play in Japan coming okay. out after my junior year, which was for good money. But I was like, I have one more year. I had a really good junior year. I, you know, I felt like I had a chance to go, you know, maybe to the NBA. So I ended up going back to school, um, Think it worked out, you know. You know, all conference and all that. If it wasn't for Jim for that, I've been player of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was, I was for second. Sure. Yeah, I was finished second, even over Kawhi and all that. So I had a really good senior year, but it was the lockout year. Yeah. Which, of course, my story that's kind of, <laughs> kind of went. That's tough. It all worked out, but yeah. it, was, it was the lockout year. So 
uh, my agent was just like, hey, you can go make some money or we can kind of wait it out. So I got an offer in Spain and I took it. And from there, overseas journey, 12 years later. Also, so you played like in Turkey, right? And oh, other, yeah. Like, yeah. A def- bunch of different spots. Everywhere, man. I played in Italy, Spain, France, Japan, Romania, Turkey, Israel. Uh, I think I said Russia. Yeah, oh, everywhere. Geez. So then, so your family's Nigerian, right? Mm-hmm. So then... Is that like, how did it get to be so you're, you know, it was 2016 when you were on the Nigerian team? Yeah. So how did that like come about? Like, do they just, yeah. Um, did they send you an invite while you were playing overseas or how did that, how did that work out? No, they actually got me right after college. So when I graduated that lockout year, okay. um, they helped me get my passport. So both my parents are Nigerian. So okay. I wasn't like anything like that. So uh, they helped me get my Nigerian passport. So I had dual citizenship. Okay. And, uh, I think I played with them for the first time in 2013, and then we played played a few tournaments with them. Won the Afro Basket, which is how we qualified for the Olympics. Yep. So it was the first time in the, in the country's history, Nigeria's history. So that was That's so cool. like an unreal, you know, experience. Just being playing in Africa is like nothing else. Like, I mean, I played in the Olympics, and you know, I played in Barcelona and in Madrid. Madrid yeah. all that. Nothing was like playing in Africa, like the fans and just. It was just, it was so cool, man, That's just awesome. to be able to, you know, play for your, you know, the motherland, basically, Absolutely. you know. So, um, yeah. And then from there, we went to the Olympics and was able to play there. That's cool. 16. So, you know, so in the, even just in, you know, this last Olympics, we saw South Sudan, yeah. you know, grow and all that. So I yeah. guess the next question is like, what do you think is needed to continue to grow basketball in Africa? Because it's, you can see that it's building yeah. more and more and more. What do you think is still kind of needed for that to happen? It's just once the infrastructure gets in place, I feel like African basketball is going to just take off. Because right. right now it's like, you know, if the the Biafra War was what in the you know, 60s, 80s, something yeah. like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a young country. So yep. uh, once the infrastructure gets in place and, you know, the funding to, to, to kind of start grassroots basketball kind of takes place. They're in the process now. I know a lot of the guys I put on national team with want to, you know, be able to step in there and be able to help. So it's just kind of the, I guess the, whoever the delegation is that runs it, the national, the yeah. Nigerian Basketball Federation kind of releasing, you know, power a little bit, letting some uh, young blood come in there that wants to like actually, you know, expand on what we've done. So hopefully that happens. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a long process, but. Yeah. Cause it seems like the interest is there, but yeah, when there's absolutely. just nowhere to play or you didn't have the equipment mm-hmm. or the, you know, the funding for teams and whatever, right. it just can kind of just die down. So it seems like exactly. it just, you just kind of have to have that, that infrastructure in place. Yeah. So, I mean, even, so when I played in, in the Olympics, um, so we had a training camp in uh, LA and Houston, right? So okay. we played against Team USA in Houston. We had a training camp in LA at the Clippers facility. Okay. All that was done because we had an NBA coach come in, brought in all his people yep. and did that. So, I mean, you hate to, you know, like, it's, you had a savior come in and do that, but that's, that's what happened. Yeah. And then even when they went to the Olympics last uh the 2022 was because of COVID, you know, yeah. like that one, um, Mike Brown was the coach. So he came in and was, got you know, it. Yeah. so like you had that. And then even South Sudan that made it this year, they had, um, Royal Ivory, yeah. you know, ex NBA yeah. guy that came in. So yep. now they're on track, but it's just a little bit of, again, it goes back to having an infrastructure in cool. place. Great. Yeah. All right. So then going back to your kind of overseas career, what do you feel is like kind of the best, and maybe the hardest part about playing overseas because you've had a 12 year career and you yeah. went all over and all that. So what's kind of the good and bad in it? Man, the, the best part is, is one, how competitive the games are because I mean, every game matters. You know, you play if some, some countries are playing one game a week, maybe two, you're playing different, you know, different type of competition. So it's like every single game is like life or death. Basically you sure. win. It's a great week. You lose. It's, it's the worst yeah. week ever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the fun part. The part that sucks is that you got to wait for family. Right. Yeah. So, you know, friends, family missing Thanksgiving, missing Christmas, you know, I'd be able to come home for most Christmases, but you know, missing those holidays and not being able to kind of, you know, feel like your life is on pause for, for nine months uh, yeah, yeah. out of the year type of thing, even though you're having fun and seeing the world and whatnot. So, I'd say just a combination. And for those and for those people that don't know, like a lot of these are shorter term contracts. It's not like yeah. it's not like the NBA where you have a five year deal. Right. It's your six months here, nine months here, yeah. stuff, contracts oh, yeah, yeah. like Absolutely. that. It's usually, usually year to year type of thing or nine months, six months, whatever. Yeah. So like out of my 12, 13 years playing, I only went back to the same team twice. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that, uh, that, that is even kind of high for most people. Usually it's <laughs> you're on a different team every single year you play. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Well, you've made kind of the transition into mm-hmm. post career and now you're a financial advisor yep. with Edward Jones. Yeah. So, um, with that in mind, what do you think, um, what would, I guess, what would be your, um, suggestion for people that are just getting started to kind of build their wealth? What's, what's a big catalyst or what do you think it'd be good for them to think about or start doing? Good question. Um, I would say a couple of things. The first one is pay yourself something like you're making this money with playing overseas and usually it's tax free for the most part. Yep. Um, so pay yourself something like yep. put something away for retirement, for a house, yep. you know, save like, so out of every check when I was playing, I would make sure that I would put a, put away a certain amount, just yep. save it, yep. you know, save it, invest it, whatever. So, uh, real estate, like I know you, you're big yeah, and yeah. helped me a lot. So I know my agent, uh, he told me, he was like, Hey, you know, Denver market's pretty high. You should buy something. At yeah, the time yeah. I was, you know, back in Georgia and I was like, Denver, I was like, I don't know, man. And that was the best thing I ever did. 2014 buying a, buying a place. And from there on, I would just, you know, buy investment property every couple yeah. of years. So obviously if you're, if you're, if you're blessed able to do that, if the market makes sense, the numbers make sense. That's a good way to, to kind of, you know, shelter that, you know, income that you're having while you're overseas, but just investing. So I've yeah. been able to help a lot of, uh, overseas athletes, X NBA, NBA, whatever yeah, that yeah. are my clients now. And, um, just saving for retirement because, you know, usually you're not going to have a traditional IRA or 401k over there. So you have to either create your own, whether it's, you know, a SEP IRA or any type of IRA, you got to open up and yep. be able to kind of save for retirement because you only play for so long, man. Yeah. I had a 12 year career and which is short in the grand scheme of things, but that's a long time for basketball. Yeah. So, um, just paying yourself. Man. Yeah. That's the first thing. Pay yourself, make sure you're investing something at the, at the very least, put it in a high yield savings account. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, making sure that yeah. that money's growing, growing and right? not just you're not just spending it the not moment you get it. it. Absolutely, love it. Cool. All right. Well, um, next question is kind of more of a basketball focused question. Is what do you think is kind of the most underrated skill, whether that's a tangible, mm-hmm. like on court skill, or an intangible off the quarter, kind of a more of a driver teammate kind of thing? What do you think is most underrated skill in basketball? Underrated. Oh. Well, I, I would say playing hard. Yeah. Playing hard is if you can play hard. Like if you can play hard is like obviously you don't have the measurables of a Giannis, but I've seen guys overseas who are literally over there just because they play hard. Yep. They play hard. They know the place. Yep. Like it's that simple. You know, you can just make an impact whether it's offensive rebounding, whether it's just you know those timely plays. You yeah. Think of like a Drew Holiday, even though he's yeah. he's pretty skilled, but just guys like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's an underrated skill, just being able to play hard, having a you know high motor. And what's great, and what I think what makes the I think what makes the great players great is they have all the tangible skills, mm-hmm. but then they also have that I'm going 110 oh, yeah. percent every time. That's what makes like Kobe Kobe is because like he just. Oh, was man. going as hard as the guy who's the last guy on the bench, yeah. even though he's one of the best players in the world, yeah. you know? So, but that uh, other underrated skill that I've learned and I, I think is even, even if it's in recreational basketball, mm-hmm. not even a high level competitive, it's just self-awareness. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> Let me start on that. Oh yeah. It's just knowing yeah. one, either knowing your role mm-hmm. and also being self-aware about, okay, maybe this is the best way I can yeah. play winning basketball on this team. You know, just because you can shoot doesn't mean that that's <laughs> the best thing oh, yeah. for you to do in this game. Right. You know, and so just being self-aware mm-hmm. to be, and being able to adapt to a lot of different situations because, I mean, basketball is just such a chemistry-driven sport. Yeah. You have one guy that's not self-aware that's jacking up stuff that he should never be jacking up. Yeah. It can kill not only your chances of winning, but also just everybody's morale because everybody's like, Right. We can't pass it to this dude. Yeah. You know, or, you know, stuff like that. So that's a that's, underrated that's, that's very underrated. And I would say I didn't have that skill when I first went overseas. Like I think I developed that like after my uh second or third year. That's yeah. When I started to see like, hold on, okay. I don't I want to post up and score because I think I can score every time, yeah, but yeah. maybe that's not how the offense <laughs> is gonna run if I want to stay here and play, right? Uh-huh. I'm gonna have to, you know, adapt to the system. So once I figured out like, all right. Find out what the system is, see how you can, you know, get into that system, impact it and, you know, impact winning and things like that. I think it made my career like last as long as, because otherwise that was probably got to be out. Cause I, I wanted to get the ball to score every single time. For and, sure. Like, wasn't worried about, you know, wasn't like, getting my teammates involved and whatnot. So. And I think what's, what's 
interesting about whether it's working hard or self-awareness and whatever yeah. is that like, he, yes, you may not be, you, it may not be the funnest job or it may not be the job where you're the most popular guy on the team or whatever, No doubt. but all of your teammates love the crap out of you. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. because they, you just know that that guy's going to mm -hmm. pl play his role and whatever. Yep. And you're not having, you're not having to second guess who he thinks he is. He just knows who he right. is and for that. So anyways, man, let's go. All right. Well, the, um, before I ask the last question up first, I forgot to say this at the beginning, but I want to say thank you to a wing visuals for opening up oh, the yeah. spot to us. Awesome. It's a great podcast space and they have yeah, all the videography and photography things you can ever imagine. So check them out. But Andy, last question, yep. and it can be sometimes be the hardest question. If you right. got to pick one thing, okay. what's your favorite thing about basketball? Favorite thing about basketball? Oh, yeah, that's tough. Uh, um, let me see. I mean, obviously, the, the competition, right? Mm -hmm. That competition, like be, getting lost in the game. For me, that's my personal favorite thing. It's just when you're you're not you're not worried about the score, you're not worried about the time, you're just worried about doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing at that particular moment, making the right play. Whenever all that stuff kind of is all in line, I mean that's for me that's basketball nirvana. Oh like, my gosh. It, that's that's just a that's just a great feeling. Obviously you don't have that every game, but you know, when, when that does happen, you feel like you're in the zone type of thing. That's there's like no feeling better than that, I think. It it becomes like just a, it comes such a moment of you just completely lose yourself in what yeah. you're doing. Like you could be having the worst off the court time, mm -hmm. all that, but they, like a lot of players say that like that's their safe haven. It's exactly. on the court because yep. you, it like, because the game happens so fast mm -hmm. too that you don't have time to be like, I missed this shot. Man, my wife's mad at me at home. <laughs> right. Like you don't. It's like you miss your shot. Get back on D. Okay, yep. pass, pass. You know what I'm saying? So like, it is such a, it's such a competitive environment that happens so quick that you can play for an hour, two hours, and whatever, yep. and just be lost. Yeah, and that's that's the perfect word for safe haven. So yeah. I mean, that, like literally, no matter what's going on in the world, as you said, you, when you go out, you step on that basketball court nothing else matters right so yep. for me that's what i missed the most and that's my favorite thing about basketball because even when i was a kid that was my favorite thing like no matter what was going on whether you had this or didn't have that when you went on the court like nothing else mattered so i mean yeah i'd say that's my favorite part of basketball and i appreciate it all right oh, andy yeah, appreciate I mean, the time man for thanks sure. for making it when I pull up with my dogs we gonna ball like swish, swish, swish. no i ball like swish, swish, swish. no i ball like